Well, almost welcome to 2015. Almost Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. I'm not sure I'm supposed to be today. Somewhere between, right? Somewhere kind of caught between the two. Um, so whichever way you're, it's going for you, so you can keep celebrating Christmas or enjoy the new year. We're going to do some of both this, this week in our family. Um, here at FOS, uh, we've been in a series called Move. And the idea of Move has been to learn how God moves us along as his people. Now, I want to say this to you. Some of you don't consider yourselves his people. You're like, I'm, I'm not a Jesus follower. Don't even know if I want to be a Jesus follower. It's okay. Because there's news here today that you can use very practically for 2015, whether you want to be a serious Jesus follower or not. But for serious Jesus followers, this is an important series. And um, we're heading into some interesting territory. We've so far looked at how God moved in the Christmas story, how he began to move people along. And we, we talked about Jesus moving to the planet on Wednesday, Wednesday night as we did our Christmas Eve service here. And before that, the wise men and shepherds and Mary and Joseph all were moved along to worship at that first Christmas. Now, I'm, I'm going to leave all that behind and I'm going to go totally Old Testament on you, okay? How about that? For just, for, just for today, next couple of weeks, we're going to go Old Testament. We're talking about how God moved people in the Old Testament. And, um, and so to help me get into that a little bit, uh, I'm going to go a little off-road today, um, and, and I'm going to ask you a very important theological question, because as a pastor, I get asked really tough questions. I get asked questions that really there are no good answers to. This is the question that's one of the most haunting questions of all, and this is going to set you up for a great 2015, Okay. Will my dog go to heaven? My dog may not. <laughs> According to the UPS guy and the mailman hate my dog. But she really likes them. A lot. Um, so this is, the, this is a pressing question. Do dogs go to heaven? So I'm going to try to answer this today for you by going through the Old Testament, through a story in the Old Testament, an ancient story that I think you'll find fascinating and helpful, and we'll loop all the way back at the end of the message, and maybe we'll have an answer for this question. Will my dog go to heaven? We'll find out. Okay? Let's see how it goes. So, I'm going to start the story about 600 miles northeast of Jerusalem. I'm going to start it in a great ancient city. And in that great ancient city, there were 120,000 people and a lot of animals. That's what the scriptures tell us. There were 120,000 people and a lot of animals. This is important because a lot of animals, things are going to come back at the end of the story. So hang on to that. This is the context. This is where we're going to a city, 120,000 people with a lot of animals. And the scripture bothers to tell us that there were a lot of animals there. So walk, work with me through this story. We'll go into that. Okay. Now in that city, um, it's a city today you would know as Mosul, Iraq, about 600 miles northeast of Jerusalem. In Mosul, Iraq, there is a, um, there's a temple. Now it's been a Christian church. Today it's a mosque. It's a, it's an Islamic mosque because, uh, Islam and Christianity share a story about a certain prophet. And the name of this temple is Masad Jami Nebus Yunus. Anybody ever heard of that? <laughs> I hadn't either. It's okay. Um, the name of the mosque is the Great Mosque of the Prophet Jonah. And inside that mosque, they tell me, I've read, that there is a whale bone and perhaps the remains of Jonah himself. Pretty cool, huh? Now, what's interesting is, by the way, this city, at least at this point, is about 500 miles off the coast. It's, it's desert. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's way away from the ocean. It's not a seaport. This is far away. And, and in the time of Jonah, this city was huge. It was growing. It wasn't yet the capital of the Assyrian Empire, but it was soon going to be. Jonah was, on, was, was marching around doing his thing in the, in the seven, 790s or so B.C., before Christ. And he is, um, he's living in and around Jerusalem in that, in that area. And God is going to send him to this city that we know now. It's, it's Mosul now, but it was called Nineveh at that time. 
to the great city of Nineveh that had 120,000 people and lots of animals. And today, that mosque is still there where you might be able to see a whalebone and the remains of Jonah, maybe. We'll see. So that's the setting. This is where we're going with the story to figure out this thing. So the book of Jonah tells us this, that the word of God, W-O-G, came to Jonah in Jonah 1. And the word of God came to Jonah, and he said to Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach against them. I want you to tell them that they have 40 days. And in 40 days, it's going to get bad. Now, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Do you know why he didn't want to go to Nineveh? Because they weren't the people of God. Because he hated these people that lived in Nineveh. The Ninevites, the Assyrians, were, were fierce in battle, and they were horrible to the people they captured. They, they, they executed people, and they initiated torture that's almost beyond imagination. One of the ways they tortured people was this. If they captured you in battle, they might do this to you. They might take you and bury you in the sand up to your shoulders where only your head is above the sand. And in the middle of the desert sun, in the heat, they would cut off your eyelids. And then they would take your tongue out of your mouth and they would nail it to the ground. And then they would leave you there. Now, you figure out what happens next. It's not good. And that's just one of the atrocities atrocities of this particular tribe of people that Jonah hated so much. They were outside of the realm of the Israelites. They were not chosen people. These were not good people. And Jonah decided, (laughs) I ain't going. Okay? I ain't going. I will not go there. So Jonah decided he was going to go away from the presence of God. Jonah 1.3 tells us this. It says, Twice in one verse, it says that Jonah decided to go away from the presence of the Lord. He decided to go away from the presence of the Lord to to a city called Tarshish. Now, we think, you say it ten times fast, T-A-R-S-H-I-S-H, Tarshish, okay, which we believe is in Spain. Now, perhaps there were good travel brochures for this place. Um, We don't know. But we do know this, that where he was headed was away from God. And this is what I know. In this room today, sitting here today, I have friends, some of you, who have heard clearly from God what you should be doing. (laughs) And you've decided, I ain't doing it. I'm going to go away from God. I'm running the other direction from what God has for me. And in your mind, you make up a new story about what might be next. In Jonah's case, it was Spain. In Spain, they tell me is pretty, and maybe there's nice beaches, and perhaps really beautiful bikini-clad women. I don't know, but some way in his mind, there was a paradise somewhere else away from the presence of the Lord. So Jonah decided he's going away, and he's going to go to paradise, or Tarshish, because to be in the presence of God means you've got to deal with God. Sometimes we don't want to deal with God. Sometimes we don't want to hear from God. Now, this is, this is where the story picks up with what you're familiar with, right? You know what happens next to Jonah, right? He goes down to a city called Joppa, away from God. And while he's in Joppa, he buys passage to Tarshish on a ship setting sail that's going 1,200 miles in the opposite direction of where God told him to go. He's headed east when he should be going west. So he's going to, he's going to put a gap of about 1,700 miles between, his, between God's chosen destination and the destination he's chosen for himself. You ever wanted to do that? Be about 1,700 miles away from where God has asked you to be? Any of you guys ever tried that out in your life? I've done it a bunch. So Jonah buys passage on this ship. When the ship hits the seas, it's not long before the ship is in trouble in a giant storm. The scriptures are clear about who brought the storm. 
Do you know who brought the storm? God. The ship is about to sink. These pagan sailors who are in charge of the ship draw lots. And this is the way they could figure out things, they thought. So in this case, the short stick fell to Jonah. And Jonah, who had been asleep in the bottom of the boat, had to fess up. Yes, I serve I serve the God of the Israelites, and I'm running from him. And the only way you're going to get out of this is to throw me overboard. And these sailors don't want to throw him overboard because they know this isn't a good idea. Because if we throw him overboard, then God's really going to be mad at us. So these pagans begin to pray to God. They said, please don't hold this against us, but he's got to go. And so finally, they toss him overboard. And you know what happens next, right? What happens next? Jonah is drowning in the ocean, and then what happens? A whale. Now, we in, in the King James Version of the Bible of Scriptures, it's called a whale, and that's where we pick up the notion that it's a whale, and perhaps it was a whale. The Hebrew word for that is dag gadol. Dag gadol swallows Jonah. Now, we really don't know what dag gadol is. The book of Matthew in the New Testament picks it up in Greek, and they give it the word ketos, which simply means sea monster. We don't really know. Was it a whale? Was it a fish? Was it a sea monster? I don't know. But here's the challenge with it. Here's something you'll have to deal with. Jesus, in his, his referencing the story of Jonah, seemed to believe that somehow the story of Jonah really happened and that Jonah was really in the belly of something, Dagadol, Ketos, whale, whatever, for three days. And Jesus was fine with that. So guess what? I'm fine with that too. Because Jesus is the smartest, wisest, most important person that ever lived. And if he thought it was okay to be cool with that, then I'm cool with that. Okay? Now, you might be smarter than that. You may have another workaround. Good for you. <laughs> I'm just not that smart. Okay? But you might be. But we know this, that Dagadol, a sea monster, swallowed Jonah. And Jonah, in the pit of that sea monster, went down into the depths of the water. The depths of the water, in those terms, was called Sheol, or hell, a near-death experience. And he's down in the pit, having life his own way, traveling away from God. It's interesting to me that people are frustrated with God when they've chosen to move away from God, to head to their own man-made paradise, and they wind up in Sheol, and then you're mad at God. Really? It doesn't make any sense. You're like a ninth grader in high school that won't do your math homework, and you're mad at your teacher when you fail. Like, are you kidding me? What's, what are you doing? If you choose to live life away from God, He will let you. So don't be surprised at the outcome. That you will be swallowed up by something in your life. If you choose to live away from the presence of the Lord, if you choose to ignore the Word of God in your life, I can promise you this, sooner or later, you will make a hell of your life. You will wind up in Sheol. And I can also promise you this, it is not God's fault. Was the sea monster whale thing, was it a curse or a blessing for Jonah? It was a blessing, wasn't it? The hell you're in right now, you may have chosen, you may have created, you may have moved into. If you will cooperate with God, that hell can be a place where you can hear from God again. But you must choose. So Jonah is in the pits. He's in the belly of this whale sea monster thingy with seaweed wrapped around his neck. Probably not smelling too good. Probably looking a little green down in the pit. When God sends that sea monster back to shore 
and takes Jonah back toward the destination he was supposed to go on anyway. And at that destination, when he gets to the seashore, the whale yaks him up, up on the shore. Now, how do you think Jonah's looking about right now? It's not good, is it? He's got to be a sight, man. He's got to be like, dude, not only do you look bad, but man, you reek. What is wrong? Where have you been? You smell like, like rotting fish and nastiness and just stuff hanging off of him and green seaweed. Can you imagine what kind of nasty mess he was? And some of you, because where you are right now, because you've chosen to live away from God, You've read the travel brochure about your man-made paradise that you're going to. It's going to be so fantastic. You bought the brochure and you bought passage to a new city away from the presence of the Lord. And now you're in Sheol. Between Sheol and recovery, it's probably a mess. It's probably going to stink. It's probably going to be hard. But this is the good news. That if you will come back to that place, if you will cooperate with God, that the word of God 2.0 can come to you. And 2.0 is this. Jonah gets the same message again, Jonah chapter 3. By the way, I'm not drilling through the text today like I normally would because the book of Jonah is only four chapters long. You can read it for yourself, verse by verse this afternoon, take you about 20 minutes. But I just want to kind of relate the story to you, and then you go study it deeper. The word of God comes back to Jonah, Jonah chapter 3. Jonah, I want you to go to that great city of Nineveh. There's 120,000 people there and a whole lot of animals, and I need you to tell them a message. This time Jonah decides he'll go. And this time, this is what Jonah is glad to do. Jonah, by the way, is a prophet. He's a, he's a person, he's a man of God who's supposed to take the words of God to the people that God wants to say them to. The challenge for Jonah is he doesn't see these people as worthy of the words of God. There are people in your life, I promise, that you do not want to share the word of God with, aren't there? There are people, if you're honest, that you probably don't even want to tell about Jesus or about good news or about what God has done in the world. That was the story for Jonah. He didn't want these people to know. He didn't want them to hear about the news. But finally, because this, his way away from God didn't work out so well, He's going reluctantly now to the city to give them this message. 40 days and you die. (laughs) It says that he walked into the city a day's journey. The city is three days journey wide. It's a huge city, perhaps even more than 120,000, but but it's a large city and he's, he's a day's journey in and he begins to prophesy against the city. And by the way, as someone who hates them, he's glad to say this to them. 40 days and you're going to die. It's going to go bad. He's probably even got his little sign, turn or burn. God hates Ninevites and Nineveh and everything to do with it. You all stink. You're going to hell. It's not going to go well for you. You're all going to die. There is no hope. Have a nice day. And some of you, you have prophet's gift. Some of you guys have the gift. of You have, you have this prophetic gift inside of you. You've met people like this before. They're, they're sincere Jesus followers, but they also have the gift of prophecy. And these are the ones that have the kind of this, and I don't talk about like telling the future kinds of like weird stuff, but like they always have a word from God for you. And the word of God usually is something like this. You're evil and you're going to die. And you for sure are going to hell soon. And, they, and what's funny is they love to tell you that. And Jonah loved to tell them that. Several of, our, several of my friends here, Julie and Tim and, and, uh, and I think Gary Greer, someone used to sing in a, in a music group called Acts. A-C-T-S. It was some ador- adoring Christ through song. A-C-T-S. That was it. Acts. That's what it was. Adoring Christ through song. And it was interesting. Their favorite song to do was, God's going to set this world on fire. And then they would smile. <laughs> God's going to set this world on fire. And they'd smile. I'm like, something is wrong. Like, really? God's going to set the world on fire. We're all going to die. And you guys are so happy. I was totally confused. I'm like, this is, is this good news? I missed the memo. I don't understand why this is good. And why you're so happy when you sing it. I mean, Tim was especially happy. I don't know why, but you remember, Tim, how happy you were about that song. I mean, you just, 
Tim's on camera today. Turn around, look at camera. Look at the show. The smile you used to do when you when you did that song. Yeah, it was just like that. It was like, really? Are you kidding me? That you you're just like, are you? yeah. So Jonah was happy. Forty days, and you're going to die. And then he was he marched to the city, and it was crazy. And people began to hear this news, and the word got all the way to the king of the city. And the king, it says, got news, and it tells us that the king repented. And the king came off of his throne, and he took off his crown, and he laid it on the ground. And that king led that city to repent, to turn from their evil ways, to turn to a God they didn't even know. They heard the word of the prophet Jonah, and it tells us that he repented in sackcloth. Now, sackcloth is always a good thing for a Christ follower to wear, because sackcloth is about repentance. Sackcloth is about coming back to God. Sackcloth is about admitting my way wasn't a good idea after all. And that God, your way is better than my way. And I will bow before you and I will admit that I can't do life on my own. That only you, God, can lead my life. And only when I follow you can I become who you've called me to be and can I do what you've called me to do. And this king who was a pagan king, who led heathen people who didn't know anything about the God of the Israelites, repented and began to worship the God of Jonah. That's great news, isn't it? I mean, that's powerful. And revival hit that city. 120,000 people come to follow God because of Jonah's preaching that 40 days and you're going to die. It's a pretty simple message. It's not very long. It's a pretty good sermon. You guys wish I'd preach ones like that all the time. <laughs> Come in, 40 days, you're going to die, and we all leave. It's all good. Jonah's message was powerful because it wasn't really about his message. It was God's message. And when God's message meets his timing and meets the hearts of people that are willing to submit to him and repent in sackcloth and ashes and lay their crowns down and kneel before the king and admit that his way is better, fantastic things happen. And my hope for you in 2015 is that no matter where this finds you, that somehow, that as we turn the corner on a new year, that you would repent, that you would turn back from doing life your own way, that you would stop going your own way. Don't read the travel brochures. There really isn't any paradise away from God. There is no destination away from God that is good. I will promise you this. If you insist on going away from God, you will experience hell on earth. And if you don't turn back, perhaps hell after this earth. Because God will grant you your wish to live away from him. He will let you live as you wish. So you must choose to hear the word of God and repent, and come back, and then go his way, and then do like this king did in this fascinating story. He repents in sackcloth. The Hebrew word for that is simply sack, S-A-Q. And S-A-Q, sack, sackcloth, always fitting for a Christ follower. Let's look and see what happens to Jonah. Watch him. Jonah, <laughs> after he preaches against the city, he goes outside of the city, and he sits up outside the city and he watches to see what God is going to do. And you know what he wants God to do, right? Yeah, he's ready for it to burn, man. He's like, let's get this party started. Let's get down some fire from heaven. Let's smoke some people. Let's see some bacon. Bacon, bacon, bacon. I think he's going to be good. He can't wait for God to do what he's going to do. But instead of that happening, these people repent. And this king repents. And there's sackcloth and there's people turning back to God, and they're crying out to God. And just so that, that Jonah is protected during the show of what's happening, God makes a plant grow up out of the desert to protect Jonah from the scorching sun, and that plant grows up over Jonah. 
and it protects Jonah from the noon heat. But then Jonah's pouting. He's, he's upset. And he says to God in his prayer, let me die. Why does Jonah want to die? 120,000 people and a bunch of animals have just been saved from the wrath of God. And Jonah's response is, let me die. Why? Because Jonah's hatred of these people is so hot. He can't stand the thought that they would come back to God. Now listen carefully. I'm afraid that some of us, at least in the church in America, are so red hot about telling everybody where they're going and how fast they're going to get there and how soon they're going to be turned into bacon that we really don't want them to come to know Jesus and we really don't want them to come to know God and we really don't want them to repent. We just want to tell them you're going to burn in hell. Interesting that when that king repented and all his people in sackcloth and ashes that God repented too. And God offered grace and mercy and held out his arms of love and brought them into his way of living. By the way, in Jonah's prayer to God, he's pouting. So God appoints a worm to go chew the plant down and remove the shade. And then he sends a breeze from the east, a hot breeze into the face of Jonah just to cook his brain just a bit. And he has a conversation with Jonah, and it goes something like this. Jonah, you're more concerned about that plant that I provided than you are about these people in Nineveh. Don't you care that there's 120,000 people and a whole lot of animals? Some versions of the scripture say, and a whole lot of cows. Don't you care? Don't you care what happens to them? Because I do. I care. Jonah, these people matter to me. They're way more important to me than your silly plant was. Can't you understand this, Jonah? So here's my question. Where are you in this story? Are you hearing the word of God for the first time and being asked to follow him for the first time? Or have you decided to go away from the presence of God to your own chosen destination? And have you made a hell of your life? Is that what's happened to you? Have you made a mess of your own life? Are you living in Sheol? There's hope that in that place, that hard place, that hellish place, that if you will turn back to God, that you'll hear his word again. He would love to use you for his purposes for the planet. He would love to use you to share this great news of a God who loves, of Jesus who was sent as his son. He would love to use you for his purpose on the planet. The question is, will you play along? Will you repent? Will you put on sackcloth like that king did? Or are you going to be like Jonah? Interesting that, that, that at the end of the story, that a king who lived 600 miles northeast of the throne of the supposed place where God lived in Jerusalem, a pagan king would bow down to God. And that the prophet of God would rail against God himself. It's possible to be so self-righteous that you wind up farther from God than pagans. But it'll be your choice. So I'm not really sure if dogs go to heaven, but I'm sure about this. 
that sometime a long time ago that God cared about 120,000 people and a whole lot of animals. I think he still does. Let's pray. So God, help us to hear clearly from you. Where are we in this story? Now, God, I'm asking you to press into the lives of each of my friends here, of each person that's here, that you'll press into their life, and that, God, you would invite them into your story, that the word of God would come back to them, that they would hear from you and they would choose what they're going to do now, whether they will participate in your story or whether they will run away from your story. God, some of my friends, man, they're making a hell of their life right now. They chose a destination away from you that looked pretty good when they started. But God, right now, man, they're just crying out. Would you hear them right now? And God, some of my friends here today, it's the first time they've really heard this news that there's a God who loves them, that even cares about animals. Now, God, help that news to press into their hearts. Break their hearts and help them to bow before you and to accept you as their king, to allow Jesus to be the Lord of their lives. And God, I have a few friends here who are being asked to do incredibly hard things, to love the unlovable, to serve in places that are so difficult. Or maybe it's just to bear up under the burden of everyday life in a workplace that's hard, where you seem far away, where it seems like everybody there is opposed to God. Would you help each of us, God, to take our place in our workplace and at our schools? in 2015 and to share the good news that there is a God a God who loves a God who's compassionate to those who are evil help us to carry that news into the world around us a God be clear and be strong be powerful may the knees of the proud bow here today ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's a few things I want to make sure you take away. Number one, sackcloth is always in fashion for one who would follow Jesus. If you want to be a person that follows Jesus, a life of active repentance is required. You cannot follow Jesus and keep going your own way. You cannot follow him and get to run your own universe. It doesn't work that way. What it does take is bowing down to him and putting on sackcloth and admitting you were wrong. And I got to tell you, if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to do that a whole lot. It's not a one-time thing. It's not come to the altar today and then forget about it. It is come to the altar and stay in the presence of Jesus. And moment by moment, day by day, you're bowing to him and you're putting sackcloth on again and saying, okay, God, I get it. What Jesus asked me to do is better than my way. And you're going to have to learn this. It'll get, it's, just, it's just something we've got to do. It's a lifestyle of repentance. It's a lifestyle of living in sackcloth. Sackcloth is always in fashion for one who would follow Jesus. A couple other things. You can run from God, but you can't hide. You won't be able to get away from him. He knows where you are. And if you've made a hell of your life, he's there too. You see in the pit, in that sea monster, when Jonah was down in there with sea reed wrapped around his head, smelling bad, looking pretty nasty, God was there. And if you feel like that's you right now, God is here. And there are friends here who will pray with you and talk with you and help you figure out what's next. You see, the last thing I want you to think about is this that God is a God of compassion. He's a God who's slow to anger and he loves to show mercy. Even in the Old Testament, even to the Assyrians who were outside of God's will, away from God, God was even actively reaching out to them then. 
and he's still actively reaching out to the world today, even to people that we hate. He still loves and he's still reaching out and sometimes he's going to ask you to be a part of telling that good news. This is what I'm positive of, that he's going to invite you to share the good news of Jesus and of the kingdom of God coming to your friends and to your family. Now, as we turn the corner on 2015 here at Foes Community Church, we want to put tools in your hand and training under your belt to help you be an effective witness for Christ. We want, to, we want to train you and teach you, equip you, empower you to do this. So we're going to go into a season here in January, February, March of going through a curriculum set called Christianity Explored. We're going to teach you the good news of Jesus in a way that's going to make it easy for you to then share that same good news with other people, maybe around coffee after work or maybe over lunchtime at work or maybe it's a school group that meets at McDonald's before school or maybe it's a, a little club that meets after school. There's a lot of ways you can use this material, but we're going to spend the first part of the year just bringing you through it as people who travel with us here at FOS. And then we hope that you'll use that material, you'll use these ideas to share this good news of Jesus with other people. So I'm inviting you to consider joining a small group, participating in learning this material, going through it with us January, February, March. Next week and the next two Sundays, we'll have small group cafe over here and new small groups are starting, lots of places for you to connect and to, to be a part of this. So I hope you'll do that with us and you'll get ready to be a part of the story. And I hope you don't wind up like Jonah, just pouting, but I hope you wind up like a king who bows his knees to the work of God. So 